Kentucky. We'll see. Cheryl Bernard joins us, a woman that needs no introduction. One thing that I just learned, though, Cheryl, Olympic silver medalist, of course, and household name, president and CEO of the Canadian Sports Hall of Fame. That's a cool job. That's an amazing job. It's, um, you know, you're showcasing some of the very best athletes in our country, and then you're also showcasing what they've done beyond sport. And for us, that's it's it's a pretty amazing day job. Mm-hmm. And night job. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, with President and CEO is never a uh, relaxing job, that's for sure. But I got to ask you, I saw a guy the other night going into the saddle loan for game one, a young dude, probably 25 with a Flames jersey. He had Daryl Sutter. He had tape across his back with Daryl Sutter on the back written. That's how much they love Daryl here. Isn't he something? He's amazing. I, <laughs> I, you know, I really did wonder when they brought him back. I thought, you know, I... I it's a little gruff. <laughs> yeah, and then what he's done, I, I, I couldn't say anything better about what he's done with this team, how this team responds to him, um, the success we've had. I mean, I've been here and been a Flames fan all my life, and so I was able to go to game one, which was so much fun to see, and hmm. uh, just congratulations to being able to do that and transform a team like that in our city. Well, and the cool thing is... So she was born in Grand Prairie. You moved here at three. Three. The excitement you've been here through then, 89, 04. Do you get the sense that it's coming? Are we I, there yet or it's getting there? It's or? coming. I yeah. see us in the final for sure. I'm, yeah. I, we're in the final. And then it's sport and anything can happen. But this just seems like a different team. And, and I watched that game the other night and they're comfortable with a close game. They were comfortable with a one point lead, one nothing. And, uh, I was getting a little nervous in the third period, but uh, they held on and went to the defense and, and they maintained it. And I, I just, I hope for this city and I hope the Flames don't hear this, but I hope for this city, you know, everybody's riding on this after two years of the pandemic and right. to have this success, I think we all need it and want it so badly. <laughs> oh, for sure. You can just feel oh. it. People are just ready to let loose. Yeah. The only thing is we brought you here to talk curling, not hockey. Oh, so, okay. Okay. No, 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 no. That's my bad. <laughs> But it's just they're cheering for the orders in Calgary because they want a second round meeting. Do you get that sense? Oh, yes. 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 I, I would oh, love an Edmonton. Uh, Alberta battle would be amazing for this. Yeah, I don't think that I, I, I'm not sure they can handle it. This, <laughs> this city. But no, no, it was my so I'll switch from one ice sport to another. When you're watching as a competitor that you are, do you think about the close games and stuff? How are you in close games? Clearly, you're a champion, you know, so it didn't scare you off. Yeah, you, yeah, I think you really, as an athlete, just immerse yourself in what you're doing, and you don't think, if you are thinking about how close the game is or what the score is, you got problems. It's, you know, so it's really that mental strength and stamina that you have the ability to just focus on what you need to do and not think of outcome and not think about what the score is and not think, what if? What if I miss this shot? So, you know, it's an art, and I think teams and all, all sports um, players now they work really hard to be able to kind of control that focus because it's what's required now in order to compete at the highest level mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. well for two years i honestly during the pandemic i was really worried how we as a sports community in this country were going to make it out of it and they're all like i was watching the bubble here in calgary for the curlers it just seemed yeah horrible yes. and I, t- I knew some of the competitors and they said it was horrible it was horrible for yeah. the broadcasters too. Yeah, too. <laughs> it it it's not healthy. It's not the mentally way mentally or physically. Mentally, physically, to be locked yeah. in rooms, um, you know. And I think a lot of these teams they'll go play a game, say the Briar or the Scotties at the Bubble. They'll go play a game and then they go out maybe to the patch or they go to a restaurant just to get a little bit of that release. But instead, they had to go back to their rooms, sit in a room, get up the next day and play all over again. And you could just see some of the players that needed that outlet. Um, we're really struggling. It was a t- it was a tough haul for a lot of them. Mm-hmm. I assume you were at the Briar in Lethbridge. Did you go down there uh, this year? Yeah. No, I didn't go. I did the trials, Olympic trials, and the Scotties this year. Well, the trials looked fun in trials, Saskatoon. My favorite event every four years. <laughs> well, of course, when you want it, so yeah, that's well, co- yeah, that's cool too. But yeah, it is. I mean, it wasn't full up there, and I was. What was the deal there? Talk about that experience if you don't mind in Saskatoon. The Olympic trials. Yeah. Yeah. It's. I mean. It's just every four years in the pressure. You can see the way the teams react so differently compared to a Briar or a Scotties because it's once every four years. Are they going to get to an Olympics ever in their lifetime? For some players, it's the end of their career, and this is their one last chance to maybe get on that Olympic stage. So it's just a different atmosphere. I mm-hmm. mean, the Briar and the Scotties, everybody's elevated. They want to win a Canadian championship. There's no question. But the trials is just that one step higher. People aren't joking around as much with each other. There's a little bit more 
They're tense. They're tense, and, and they're worried. Interesting you say that. And we have a couple. Well, because I was watching it very closely because of personal friends. Team Dunstone had a dreadful week. Team Botcher didn't do too well either. No. Nope. And these weren't guys that you expected would struggle. Yes. You, <laughs> you tend to see that, though. You know, you'll see some teams who have the ability. And I remember us in 09. I mean, we were probably ranked fourth going into that, those trials in 09. But I think that gave us the ability to kind of fly under the radar for a while, get settled in. It's sort of the favorites or where there's a lot of media on these teams that I think they struggle going into it and they start to focus on outcome again. And that's always a death to any athlete or any team. So, you know, it's having that ability to go in and not really think about what we're playing for and try. You know it's important. You know it's, it's the biggest games you'll ever play, but you have to somehow be able to put that in the back seat and just play the game that you know how to do it's the same rocks it's the same competitors and it's the same crowds typically so it, it's it's just a lot of mental strength for sure i'm watching the clock closely because i could go on about this forever and i will say that but so the the olympics then because you've been in the scotties the national scotties like if the trials are pressure what's the actual olympics like yeah, it's I, gonna be insane. It's a it's a completely different animal. Yeah, it's it's um and the problem is is you have no experience unless you've gone to a second Olympics, which most don't. You have no experience as to what you're gonna expect because it's not like a world championship or a briar. It's it's just its own beast, and you really have to rely then on kind of your family and your bigger team, your coaching team around you, your support system, our curling association. They bring in a lot of experienced people. Um, and then you just have to have a really good perspective that, you know what, in the end, and I truly believe this allowed our team to stand on the, the podium in 2010, is that we're going to go home to some great people, family, lives. We've got great jobs. You win or lose here, we're not going to, you know, we're not going to be, we're going to be pretty good people. And I think that really allowed us to go out there and just play and play freely. And, and we ended up with a chance at the gold and ended yeah. up with the silver. Which is pretty cool, too. Yeah, it took me a while to be okay with that. Because you're a competitor. Yeah. Yeah, it was a tough loss. We had, you know, it was in my hand um, to win that game, and I had a chance. And it was a double takeout that you'll make 80% uh, of the time, and we just missed it by millimeters. And so that, that took a long time for me to be okay with the silver, but I've, I think I've got there now, and... And uh, I look back on it, and it's pretty cool. Good for you. Yeah. Champion broadcaster Cheryl Bernard with us here at Grey Eagle. We'll be right back. We'll Cheryl Bernard is with us, Olympic silver medalist, president and CEO of the Canadian Sports Hall of Fame. You're laughing over there. You know the feeling, right? Every <laughs> I, right? I am laughing because I did go online the other day to look at what it would cost to buy Flames tickets. I was Insane. offline very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> well, in Edmonton, they're saying seven hundred dollars. What are they here? That's what seven hundred and sixty-four dollars for and decent. selling out. <laughs> Good. I'm glad. It's awesome. So we, well. We deserved. just won't be buying no, them. Yet. No, I'll be watching. But you know, 8 p.m. games. You know, that's probably that's good. I can sit down on my couch and cheer the flames on very well from there. Well, like I say, I was worried about sports and the pandemic and how we'd make it out. The NHL's just fine. There. And speaking of, by the way, with the curling, they got out of the bubble. The NMAX Center in Lethbridge was full. I say Sastel Center in Saskatoon had decent enough crowds, yeah. right? So is COVID behind the curling world? It is. I think, you know, they made it through that. I, I thought Curling Canada, kudos to them for what they were able to put on. Windsport, I mean, huge congratulations to Windsport for hosting that bubble. Tourism Calgary for putting it all together. Like, our city came together to say, we can do this. We can put these events on. Let's not cancel them. And so Curling Canada to make it through that and allow to put on a Briar and a Scotties and a Worlds and, and mixed doubles events, it was, it was incredible to see. Yeah, well, it's interesting. I was asking you in the break about retiring in 2014, and you said it was time. But yeah. this Alberta women's curling scene, and men's for that matter, it is a shark tank. Well, it's yeah. hard to get out of this province. <laughs> it, it's yeah. very hard. It was yeah. always hard. Although it, it kind of over the years would shift between uh, Saskatchewan. You know, they'd have a run, and you never could beat Saskatchewan. And, and then Manitoba would have a whole deep field in it, and hard to get out of there. And Alberta is the same way now. And... Uh, you know, I think it's going to be tough for the next few years. We've got some great teams coming up from behind that a lot of people don't know about yet. But once they break through, then now we've got some depth again. Mm -hmm. Why do you think, I think there's a somewhat rhetorical question, but why do you think these super teams are being formed? It's the talk of curling right now. Jennifer Jones' rink's broken up. My guy Ben Hebert's joined Team Botcher, which I never thought would happen. It's wild. 
It's because I think of really the last few years and where Canada has ended up in the worlds in the Olympics, um, you know, sometimes not on the podium. And so people are looking, what are we running into? We're running into countries like Sweden and Switzerland that they dedicate one to one single team to represent their country. So all their resources go to that team, uh, that team's full-time job. They don't do any other jobs. They curl full-time, eight hours a day, they spiel. We don't have that in Canada because we have so much depth which I love, but the problem is, is you've got players that they can't make a full-time living at this sport. Ben Hebert's a great point. Kevin Cooey, they work, they have other jobs. So, and I think we're starting to see where that's impacting us because these other teams that are solely focused, these other countries, um, are starting to beat Canada. And we used to always, I mean, it was expected we walked away with a gold or a silver medal. And now we're walking away a lot of times without anything empty-handed. So. I think you're just seeing teams say, how do we do it differently? Do we combine instead of spreading it thin each of the teams with talent? What about coming together? It doesn't matter if it's four skips. And you yeah. see it with Kerry Anderson's team. That's four skips that made the commitment to play the position that they were. They could all skip easily. And Seems to have worked out okay. It's worked really well. <laughs> Three Canadian championships. All right, Cheryl, I appreciate it. Thanks for the time. Yeah, thank you very much, Rod. Champion broadcaster Cheryl Bernard. Our big night last night in the Stanley Cup playoffs. Tampa won big time in Toronto. They've even that series up at 1-1. The Oilers, we had the big ceremony in hour one. As a matter of fact, put the camera on our guest if you don't mind, guys. Cheryl Bernard is with us. Uh, Olympian, champion, broadcaster. You see that Oilers jersey over your shoulder there, Cheryl? We have a little thing. The Oilers or the Flames, depending on who wins, get displayed on the stage. So we had a ceremony last hour. Oilers won. How are you on the orders? I'm, I'm having trouble sitting beside that jersey. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> I'm a true flame She's fan. a Calgary girl, <laughs> Cheryl Bernard. So we've had a lot of fun here. And the president and CEO of the Canadian Sports Hall of Fame. Cheryl's been gracious enough to stick with us here for the first segment of Hour 2. And we talked about the Flames last hour with her. The Flames are home tonight to the Stars, 8 p.m. They're looking to go up two games to none. And there's a lot of questions that have come in for Cheryl. And uh, this role of president and CEO of Canadian Sports Hall of Fame is no small job that's why i'm so happy that you stuck with us for a little bit it's a big week for you it is for next week or yeah next week so may 12th is the day that we reveal the class of 2022 in the morning at a big national media conference so we reveal who that class is going to be and then that evening in calgary we have a celebration called the power of a story and it's an education fundraiser effectively for all our education programs but we have the class come in that evening they tell some incredible stories about sport and we celebrate what sport means in the city and uh, what these incredible inductees um, have done for our country are you the person that gets to make the call to the inductees to tell them no you know mm. what i don't have a lot we have a massive 16 person selection committee they're national across this country uh, sports historians, media, and uh, it's a lot of work, and they spend hours and hours. We had 284 nominations they had to go through this year, and Holy we only smokes. inducted a class of 10. It's a tough job. I wouldn't want it, uh, but every year I say, this is the best class I've ever seen, and this is the best class I've ever seen. Wow, I can't wait. I can't wait. And but the thing is, we're going to be gone from Calgary. But you said Lee Genia, you don't mind if he reps us? No, nope, not your event? at all. I already invited Lee. Lee's oh, coming. good. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So there are some questions relating to curling and that. For one, Jeff, the Stamps fan, writes in and says, did I hear Dave Dickinson's on tomorrow? You did. Dave Dickinson, the coach of the Stamps, will be here tomorrow at Grey Eagle. Jeff also wants to know, is it true that the Canadian Sports Hall of Fame is leaving Calgary? Absolutely not. Um, you know, Canada Sports Hall of Fame is dedicated to the city, but we have gone through a bit of a reimagining. Um, you know, we've we've realized that the location we have is just not the high traffic location it needs to be, and so our next move will be downtown to downtown Calgary, some some kind of a physical location down there. But at this time, what we're doing is focusing a lot on all of our programs being beyond our walls. So we're reaching into communities with exhibits down at the Calgary Tower. We're doing education programs that are reaching across this country into classrooms. Uh, we're doing our recognition programs. We're doing uh, off-site exhibits that we set up in communities across this country and traveling exhibits. So we're actually wow. reaching more Canadians now than we ever before with the build it and they will come concept. I think you have to be more engaging, tell more stories, um, elevate these Hall of Famers and the lessons that they've learned through sport, and we're doing that through all of our pillars. I love it. Good for you. It's pretty amazing. They certainly have the right 
person in your role. Um, from Andrew Stute, a Quebecer that now lives in Saskatchewan, writes in, I, he, says, he says, I heard a lot about Cheryl when I was lucky enough to work for Ernie Richardson. She is a very inspirational lady. Would love to meet her someday. Bonjour, Cheryl. The Richardsons. Wow. The, the Richardson family, incredible family, incredible. Um, I was fortunate enough to have been able to spend time with them. That is, that is Canadian royalty in sport, curling sport. The best. All of them. The best. Uh, I could tell. You could tell stories. I could tell stories all day. <laughs> Most about I them. can't tell. Actually. Oh, I know. <laughs> well, I'll tell you this. The last time the trials, I believe it was when the trials were in Regina. Sammy was speaking, some curling event. <laughs> and he broke down crying at the podium. And he said, this is my last public speaking event. So you're very lucky to be in the room because this is my last time. Sorry, everybody's crying in the room. And I walked up to Sammy. I put my hand on his back. I said, Sammy, to tell me it's not true. I can't believe you're never going to speak again. He goes, well, I might. <laughs> That is Sam Richardson. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And I believe he did go on to do several more. Um, John in Edmonton, I'm not sure this is a question for you. I'm going to put it to you anyways. He says, what has, why has Edmonton not hosted a curling in tournament, a big curling tournament in the last several years? You know, it's interesting because cities bid. I get asked that question a lot about Calgary. Cities bid for it. They have to put up some pretty decent dollars to bid for these events. Um, the last big event that I remember in Edmonton, massive event was probably the 09 Olympic trials it's yeah. been a while but now I think with their new venue maybe they'll bid for more but it seems like curling events are going to just a bit smaller size towns uh, you mean not the big capital Edmonton's and Calgary's mm -hmm. it's going to smaller Lethbridge hosted the Briar this year so and they filled the place they did and it's rocking I, did. I, I am listening to you I'm trying to find a specific comment somebody had asked what the future was Ryan and H on YouTube says, what does Cheryl think about curling and youth players? Are we positioned well for the future? You know, I'm a bit concerned in that area because I think, uh, you know, really what's happened is a lot of, of the younger players aren't able to play in the provincials. They, they, they're, they're running up against the professionals now. So a young team to go into our Alberta provincials is going to have to play Botcher and they're going to have to play Cooey. And so a lot of these teams, I think, don't enter. A lot of teams don't want to put that big entry fee up because they know they're not going to get through. But the experience is so valuable. And, and I've been saying for years, I think that our country needs to, to, to create a web.com effectively. So kind of that younger tier program in curling where they play against each other. And then you bring maybe the top five teams up into the professional tour. And so now you have a feeder system yeah. that starts to build it. I think we're getting there. Curling's gone through so many transitions in the last few years. And I think we're starting to see that we're going to have to work really hard on the grassroots to build that up so we don't lose kids. Well, it's cool that Ben was here, as I mentioned, a couple of weeks ago. And he said that you guys, as a curling community, are looking at yourselves as to what needs to be done better. Because yeah. it's not sitting well that Canada's not holding the world right now. No. That was the sense that I got from Ben. There, yeah, I love that Ben said that because we're responsible. It's not just our association. We're yeah. responsible as role models. We're responsible as ambassadors for the game. And I think that's really, you know, top shelf to look at it that way. John in Edmonton says specifically the 2017 World Men's Curling Championship. 2017 was the last one, but it was at the old arena Rexall place. Right. So, but I mean, there's competition for these events. I get it. It's a big country with a lot of venues. There is. And, ta yeah. ta you know, we went to a Briar in Kingston. I'm thinking that was probably three years ago. It was incredible. Yeah. You know, th those areas, I think, don't have as many opportunities for other events. So they fill those buildings to the rafters and it's fun. Speaking of, there is breaking news today from the world of hockey that Moncton and Halifax, a joint bid, have been awarded the 2023 World Junior Hockey Championship. And the reason people are talking about that specifically is Regina and Saskatoon put in a bid. I believe Ottawa did as well. But Moncton and Halifax got it. And congratulations to them. I can tell you I'm pretty sure that we're going to be in Edmonton in August with this show broadcasting from the World Juniors, the 2022, the delayed world juniors finn watching in winnipeg says thank you rod and cheryl for getting to ryan's question very insightful response now as a broadcaster this is in the time we have left you got to tell me some good broadcasting okay. stories of all my friends that have gone from being on the field of play into the booth 
They all have their own story. A great example is Paul Lapolis. Are you a CFL fan? Yes. Lapo is very, like, he's like family to me. <laughs> and I said, What was the biggest thing for you, Lapo? And he goes, Having to be critical. Yeah. Because I didn't want to criticize my friends. No. But they were making me. Yeah, there's there's a balance there, yeah. right? I, I had that, a real tough time with that, to be honest, because I remember playing and hearing the criticism from the broadcasters when I was out on the ice. And some right. of it stings. And, you know, I'm always a little bit careful because curlers, in my opinion, they're not being paid millions and millions of dollars. And so, and there's families and wives and girlfriends at home and there's mothers and fathers and, and I think they're doing their best out there. I will always show another option or talk about another option mm -hmm. because I think that's what the fans need to hear at home. Criticize, I'm probably not that person. Um, you know, I've made enough mistakes in my career at the game, so I just want to show the fans at home that there's some other options. They could maybe look at this, but at this point in this time, you make the best decisions as a player on the ice, and I think we need to support that. Yeah, it just doesn't seem to be your way the more that I get to know you. No. But then you look at a guy like Russ Howard, as good a guy as you're going to find, he doesn't mind criticizing. Nope. It's, and so <laughs> we, we play off really well with each other yeah. because it's a good, you know, balance that I can point out the options. Russ will say, you know, I probably wouldn't do that. Um, so it's, it's a good, you each have your own uh, personality in the booth. It's not something it's trained. It's really who you are and what your personality is like. And, and, uh, and the chemistry between the three of us is pretty unique too. Yeah. What do you like about it? It, you know, I asked when I first took that job, I asked TSN, you know, is there training? Like, you guys are asking me to come do this. And they said, nope, just come. We're going to do the Continental Cup in Canmore and just come. So I did one event and then they asked me back for another event. And finally I said, if I'm going to keep doing this, is there some training? And they said, you know, we don't train people in this role because it really comes down to chemistry between the three of you and we can't train chemistry. So if it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. And there's really nothing we can do to train the chemistry to be better or worse so mm -hmm. so in the end it worked really well and the chemistry was there and and i was really fortunate to work with two really great professionals and some fun people and and so it's it's been a great ride well plus they want you to just be you and sort of do it your own way like joe mccusker is another friend of mine right and she's done a great job she does it her own way and yeah. I, I love joan's way and it's not my way and, yeah. and joan's not doing it the way i do it either i think you have to be you um, people, not everybody's going to like you. That's the hardest thing you have to get to understand in that role. And I'm good with it now. It took me a bit is not everybody's going to like your style and that's okay because if everybody did, then you're probably not being your true self on there anyway. So you have to live with criticism and people don't like that you criticize one of their kids on the ice or that you, um, you know, didn't agree with a call. But that's my role in there, and the people I'm responsible for is to Russ sitting on one side of me and Vic sitting on the other and the broadcast station. Mm -hmm. But you would say I would hope or agree that curling is in tremendous shape in this country right now? I think curling feels like it is. is fantastic. Yeah. I think it's doing really well. Yeah, well, the, thing, the reason I bring that up is the more you get the curlers out there and doing interviews like this, I think does help. Or else, I told you about Rachel Holman meeting her, and I was afraid <laughs> to meet her. I thought she might bite my head off, and then I find out she's the coolest girl in the league. It's, it's. Right? I, I don't think people get the one thing with curling though that's unique is you get to hear Ben Hebert or Cheryl Bernard or Kevin Cooey talk for two and a half hours in a game, and you honestly get to know their personality mm -hmm. because as players, you forget you have the mic on. So you do actually get to know people, unlike football or unlike hockey, where you're not getting that intimate back and forth. So I do think curlers have the advantage of gaining some really great fans because of who they are on the ice, what they are as a teammate, how they are as leaders. And, and I think that's a really cool part of our game. Yeah, it is. And just my last thing, when you mentioned the bubble and how tough it was, when it was here, did you have in and out privileges or did you have, because you live here, or did you have to stay in the bubble the whole time? I could see my house from the hotel and I couldn't go to it for three months. Yeah, it was, it was not a good time. Well, you don't know. And what's cool, clearly I could go on all day with you, but Tommy Wielden Jr. Yes. One of the, another exceptionally cool cat. He came down here and left that scarf the other day. He said the bubble for the CPL was in uh, Charlottetown PEI. Yep. And he goes, we could see the ocean. <laughs> 
and we couldn't go participate <laughs> in the ocean. I couldn't It'd be get so to it. It was painful. It was. It was hard. Yeah. It was really hard. And even yeah. walking around the hotel, it was a chain link fence around it. So all we could do is walk around and around the hotel. Like a jail almost. Yeah, it was interesting. Very yeah. interesting. Last time for me doing that. Well, <laughs> like we say, hopefully we learned something from it, and I think we all did. Cheryl, thanks so much. This has been a blast. Keep in touch. Thanks, Rod. Thanks. Cheryl Bernard, the president and CEO of the Canadian Sports Hall of Fame, curling champion, broadcaster.